Exhortation of the Lord. Choose heavenly life or eternal death. From hell to heaven. Jesus reveals through Jacob Lorber in Volume 2, Chapters 293 and 294. Chapter 293 Exhortation to the Children of the Earth Differences between Earthly and Heavenly Life Everlasting Death Say I, the Lord, friend and brother, every true life out of and within Jesus Christ cannot possibly be anything other than utterly blissful. But a life that is led by death the way a law enforcer leads a sinner to criminal proceedings, can only perceive any kind of pleasure in a wholly degenerate state. If he were to remove the veil, however, that life would shrink back in horror after recognizing where its escort is leading it. This is why it is better, in a way, for the people of the earth to be blind and deaf. It allows them to at least seemingly enjoy the span of their life, sauntering from death to death. I say unto you all, for many millions, their make-believe life is followed by no further one. Because just as there is life eternal, there is also eternal death. On earth there are trees upon which glorious fruits ripen quickly, and none of their blossoms flowered in vain. There are also trees that bloom abundantly and carry much fruit, but when such trees lack the proper nutrients, and have to hold on to their tasteless fruits for lengthy periods of time until they ripen. Then, three quarters fall off the branches and onto the ground before their time. I say unto you, there are only few healing herbs with which to reinvigorate such fallen off and unripe fruit. Wherever some of these fruits fall off shortly before they fully ripen, they can be gathered and stored, and they shall at least achieve premature ripening. But for fruit that fell from the branches soon after flowering due to a lack of nutrients, there is no longer a cure. With this, I am not saying that children who die shortly after their birth cannot attain everlasting life because this parable has nothing to do with earthly birth and maturation. Here we are dealing with souls that have already bloomed beautifully in the light of my grace here on earth, and have initially zealously consumed the water of life. But come times of trials, they sealed their mouths tightly, not wishing to partake of the admittedly harsh-tasting salt of life. The consequence thereof was the complete separation from the branches feeding them, and therewith came a death from which recovery is impossible. Therefore, let us leave such blind and deaf fruits to enjoy their short life. For despite their utter nothingness, their life is nevertheless long enough. Says Robert, As true as all this is bound to be, it reminds me of a Chinese and Japanese law, which limits the number of children parents may raise to six or seven. Any additional offspring must be drowned or otherwise put to death. Say I, my friend, this you do not understand as of yet. Behold, a potter forms his pot of clay upon the disc. But due to happenstance, the pot becomes malformed in the process. What does the potter do? He smashes the half-finished pot, mixes the leftovers with fresh clay, and puts the new mass on the disc to shape a less delicate vessel, which he succeeds in doing. This way, the initial material is saved for future use, but its original individuality is irretrievably lost. In short, the first self is completely destroyed, and that is, in a real sense, the everlasting death, which neither love nor recollection of a primordial existence can revive, and consequently, no development towards everlasting perfection can be contemplated there. 
Yet, maintaining the primordial individuality is of unimaginable importance, because without it, the childhood of God cannot be attained. A second birth can never be a first birth. Chapter 294 Everlasting Death The Reason Therefore and Its Nature Fate of Those Who Have Descended Into the Third Hell Threat of Judgment and Longanimity of the Lord Says Robert, having reached the spiral staircase. O oh, most loving and wise Father, words fail us to properly thank you for such an elucidation. In other words, one can find oneself alive and well in some heaven, despite the state of this eternal death. But the primordial self will no longer be there. Oh, is this not grace upon grace on your part? By eternal death we had understood hell, from where there is no escape. But should there still be a way out, considering all things are possible with you, then we think this exit cannot be anything but quite arduous. But now this matter takes on an entirely different shape. Our thanks and love for such a pretentious and glorious explanation. Say I, it especially pleases me that you are receiving this so well, but the grace received by an unfortunate being that was given eternal death is not as great as you might think. Because for some, spending a million earth years in hell with retained original individuality would be preferable to everlasting death. But if the first birth is forever lost amidst the hell of the third degree, then of course it is even worse than mere eternal death itself. As far as I can see, you have well understood what everlasting death in and of itself is. However, as of yet, you do not comprehend the actual severity of that condition. And so, I shall have to elaborate somewhat as we climb down this spiral staircase. Listen, therefore. He who finds himself in the first or second degree of hell, on account of having warped his primordial self through a perverted love, can, nevertheless, after many bitter experiences, once again become what he was in the beginning. He keeps his consciousness, and he retains his memory, and he can even attain perfection still. But, if man is neither hot nor cold, on account of a lukewarmness that is most intolerable to me, bothering with neither good nor bad, making him capable of committing the most cold-blooded abominations, as well as occasional good deeds, then all is the same to him. God and devil, night and day, life or death, truth or lie. Such an individual has fallen victim to eternal death already. With this, he finds himself in lowermost hell, from which escape is unthinkable for the primordial individuality. The foundation of such a state is a most concentrated arrogance that has gone through all stages of selfishness. These individuals have crushed themselves with such a high density of self-love that they have thereby deprived themselves of their spirit's primordial life. This is what constitutes the actual everlasting death, the worst of the worst, because it brings existence itself to an end. Such a soul is then fully corrupted. Its original totality must be dissolved into its individual primordial sparks of life through the power of fire. Then, after being blended together with completely new sparks, it must travel a long way through the plant and animal kingdoms of another planet, within a different, far-off solar system, until it finally transforms into an inferior human form. This way, only despairingly little will remain of the original individuality of such a soul, 
And that is truly the worst part, because such a soul will never get to see me as it now is and will forever remain only a soul without my spirit. It is like an unripe and rotten apple which may develop mold. It can never be an apple now, only a parasitic plant at best, which in turn has little resemblance with the original tree and fruit. Tell me whether you all have fully understood this or not. All of them speak with one voice. Lord and Father, everything is completely clear to us now. Of course, not much good can be said of such a self-inflicted loss. Yet despite all this, your great love and mercy still shine through, and all things are possible with you. It may certainly be possible that, after unmentionable eons, a little opportunity may surface for these beings to gradually get to know and love you from their primordial condition, thereby moving forward in their understanding and love. How often already have you prophesied all sorts of judgments as dire consequences through the mouth of your prophets and servants to the children of the world? But when only a few of the better ones turned to you in their hearts, you withdrew your sharp rod. Once again you blessed the earth, and you forged a path for the reformation of the evil ones. A path that was different from the one you had indicated through your prophets Jonah and Jeremiah, for instance. You had always kept your word in all prophecies for good, and you only threatened with punishments when men had totally lost sight of you. Say I. Yes, you are completely right indeed. The reason that, most of the time, I do not follow up on threats of judgment and punishment is because these things rarely improve the people affected. Mostly, it only makes them worse. And so, if only a few righteous ones turn to me, I gladly turn threats into blessings, which is exactly why I make the threats of judgment and punishment conditional. If they find hearts that fulfill the conditions in a certain way, then things will look up again. I then bless many evil ones on account of the few good ones, so they will not get an opportunity to become even worse, as is usually the case during wars. Wars have always been the best feeding grounds for the insatiable spirits of usury, as well as the best school for cruelty and infernal arrogance. Of course, it is often the case that the gentle admonitions of my angels pass by the intransigent ears of worldly men unheard, forcing me to send the voice of the devils among the deaf people. But if the voice of the heavens finds even only a small audience, then I will let the voice of the devils fall silent. For a father will certainly always remain the most gentle judge and does not immediately weigh in with blows, even if he lifts the rod threateningly. It is better to threaten for decades and turn a blind eye, than to punish for even one year. For the plants upon this our earth are of a most delicate nature, and must be treated with much mercy. The birthplace of the children of my heart is a different one compared to those of the other parts of my being. Keep this in mind always. It is exactly this tiny earth which is the birthplace of the children of my heart.